everyone. I'm Melissa McAllister, and you're listening to The Melissa Made Show. Now, for decades, I've dedicated myself to helping women break the cycle of dieting, navigate through all the fads, and change their lives through my nutrition coaching. Now, each week, I'm going to talk about everything from deep nutrition, mindset, self-care, the ideal workout routine, tips on how and why to implement intermittent fasting in your life, my favorite recipes that are not only crowd pleasers, but they're actually healthy for you, and so much more. Now, with small and consistent changes, you can defy aging while living a happier, healthier, and more heart-filled life. I'm so excited to show you it's possible with the right strategies that are so simple to adopt. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Melissa Mate Show. And I'm very, very excited about today's topic because I think this is something I know we haven't talked on the podcast yet at all. And I do think it's something that we tend to not necessarily, as oddly as it is, uh, think about when we think about health. You guys know that um, I, you know, I'm a fitness and nutrition expert. And so we talk about weights, we talk about food, we talk about muscles and cardiovascular health and all that stuff but we've not talked about the brain yet and how important is the brain. So today you are blessed with an expert, Dr. Mark Milstein, and uh, we are going to um, give him a great little introduction, but I told him before this how excited I am for this because I really don't think that this topic, my brain needs help. This topic is talked about enough. We, um, our brain is everything. And you guys hear me on occasion talk about the brain and gut connection. And I do know uh, that Dr. Milstein will talk about that a little bit, but I think you guys are going to really enjoy this podcast. So as always, you're going to listen to it once. And then I know you're going to go back, grab a pen and paper, and you're going to listen to it that second time to take those notes on how to really truly take care of that brain. So let's go ahead and get started. Dr. Milstein is a scientist, a brain health expert, public speaker, and a best-selling author. He studies the brain's role in regulating immunity and shares the tips and exercises to improve overall health by optimizing the brain and promoting longevity. Dr. Milstein believes that various lifestyle factors led by the brain, such as sleep habits and environmental toxins, tend to have a greater impact on our health than we realize. His book, The Age-Proof Brain, covers integrative scientific supported strategies to increase memory, fight off depression, improve mood, ignite energy, so important, and even prevent dementia and non-genetic Alzheimer's. So it's such a pleasure to have you here. Dr. Milstein, can I ask you first and foremost, kind of what got you into wanting to study the brain? Yes, yes. So first of all, thank you so much for having me here. I really appreciate it. I'm excited to be here. Um, Well, actually, I was at UCLA and I was studying, I was uh, part of a group of researchers that was actually studying breast cancer. And at the time um, it was discovered that something involved in breast cancer was also involved in learning and memory. A a protein was involved in both. And at the time it was interesting uh, that something in one part of the body was impacting the brain as well. And it really ties into what I talk about a lot and write about now is that things are all connected. what's happening in our brain is impacted by what's happening in our gut, in our immune system. And right about at that time, our understanding of the brain was really, I would say exploding in terms Mm -hmm. of, we were just learning that how the brain really works and based upon those insights, how we can make it work better. So for example, sleep, we were learning how, what's actually happening when we're asleep and why that really relates to how we can improve our sleep. So those types of insights just became really exciting because it was usable, actionable. And then I, I really focused on, on brain health and brain science. Okay. Makes a lot of sense. Um, which I, and you can obviously touch on this, uh, probably throughout the podcast, but to me, um, when I think of, when I think of breast cancer, I obviously think, I think of my mom who just, uh, battled breast cancer and I, my stepdad is, uh, you know, uh, my grandfather actually, uh, had dementia and my stepdad is just showing really early signs of dementia. And so for me, 
I kind of tend to think those are separate because whenever I think breast cancer, I obviously think women, which is not always true. And then when I think dementia, because of personal experience, I always think of men, which I know is not always true. So it's kind of cool um, to see that the science shows that, you know, that they, they definitely correlate with one another and learning about one absolutely helps uh, with the other. So everybody wants to live to be a hundred years old and not just live a hundred years old, but to be incredibly alert and full of energy and, you know, to be able to move around. And I know that you, um, tout the fact that your brain health has a lot to do with your longevity. Can you kind of touch on that? Yes, definitely. Just, just to clarify about the, the breast cancer and I hope your, your mom is okay. And, yes, um, it, it, is that, um, it's a protein involved in breast cancer that plays a, a specific role in breast cancer. And uh -huh. then that same protein in the brain has a totally different function. It's involved in memory, but it's the same protein. And that really started to highlight this idea that things are connected more than we yeah. thought. Um, and then in terms of how we can really take care of our brain to improve our, our longevity. Well, we, we clearly see now that we can lower risk of things like Alzheimer's and dementia by about 30 to 60%. Wow. And we, we really couldn't say that up until just uh, recently. Um, and it's based upon lifestyle factors. And I like to say they're little things that we can do each day that have a big impact. And it's not all about genetics. It's not all about what you've inherited. We have so much more control over this than we ever thought, so much more empowerment. And so it's really positive and uplifting that we're not destined in almost all cases to lose memory. In fact, 95 to 99% of all cases of Alzheimer's, for example, we now know are not strictly genetic. They're not strictly just based on genes. And so that, again, gives us so much more power over this than we ever thought. Genes play a role, but they're not the whole picture. And that's really, um, really encouraging. So you're talking about, you know, how we're learning so much about the brain right now, which um, is, is a really great thing. There's obviously new research out there about, you know, the things that may be surprising to us that kind of accelerate, accelerate brain aging. Can you kind yeah. of uh, touch on what it is that we're seeing uh, here lately that is really causing this uh, accelerated aging? Yeah, it's, it's, it's not just one thing. And that's actually a good thing because yeah. it gives us an opportunity to leverage multiple factors so that we realize that, for example, sleep is really important. And if mm -hmm. we're not sleeping uh, effectively, we're not getting really good sleep, that can prematurely age the brain. And, and just to put this all in perspective, really what the book is about is that your brain doesn't have to be your age. Your brain can be younger or older than your, your, your age. And we want to make our brain younger than our actual age. And so starting at the age of 40, the brain actually starts shrinking about 5% every 10 years. Wow. And as you can imagine, that shrinking can really devastate its ability to function, to just to work. And But what we're clearly seeing is this doesn't have to happen. We can slow this down. And so we actually want a, a full plump brain <laughs> and we want it not to shrink. <laughs> And so we, 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 what we're going to talk about is the things that we can do to keep our brain full and plump and that that keeps it from shrinking and that keeps its, uh, you know, its ability to remember and function and helps us move all the things that it does. So we don't have to follow this trajectory that our brain just has to either age faster than our age or at the same rate, we can slow it down. Okay. And um, this popped into my head as you were saying that because I, I had heard that doing things like puzzles yeah. and, you know, like Sudoku and all those things were really good for the brain. And then yeah. I think it was probably just one person, but there's always that one influential person on social media that says, that's actually not true. <laughs> so then I started second guessing myself, are these puzzles, uh, you know, good for the brain? Are they something that really helps with, you know, the longevity and, and cognition? Yeah, no, it's a great question. So when it comes to the brain games, <laughs> um, there's certain ones that are marketed that are sold, you know, you download these apps and these brain games. The studies really suggest that playing those brain games makes you better at brain games, but it doesn't seem to carry over to actually improving your memory. So on one hand, if people enjoy, you know, the brain games, the crossword puzzles, the Sudoku, keep doing it. That, that can be fun. It's a piece of the overall puzzle, but we just want to get away from this idea that that's the only thing that people need to do. Like, it's, it's like, as long as I'm doing crossword puzzles, I'm good for my brain. Yeah. We yeah. want to move away from that and say that really learning new things is the one of the most important things we can do and it doesn't seem to matter what it is as long as it's new to you so any new subject um, a musical instrument a foreign language painting a new sport is really good 
anything that's challenging your brain in a new way is really important. And then also a part of that is being social, like mm. interacting with people either through Zoom or in person, whichever it is, when we're social, we actually realize that's one of the most important parts of, of optimizing our brain health. So it, you don't have to sit and just do crossword puzzles. If you enjoy it, that's great, but it's not the only thing. And we kind of want to, I like to say cross train your brain. So you're doing multiple different things. Like if you went to the gym, you wouldn't just work out your biceps. That's going to look weird after a while. So sure. same thing with the brain. We want to do different activities, you know, one week, one day of the week, like, you know, a sport, the other day, maybe a musical instrument, the other day, learn a new subject and just mix it up throughout the week, cross train the brain. I think that's cool. And I've been, um, diligently, uh, you know, at 49 years old. So my, my brain has shrunk about 5%. <laughs> well, it doesn't, it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to, it doesn't have yeah. to. I'm going to ask yeah. you about that, yeah. but, um, I've been trying to learn Spanish and oh, I swear that, that, you know, every day it's been about 30 minutes trying to learn, uh, to work on my Espanol yeah. and I feel sharper. I legitimately feel just a little bit more clear headed. And I don't know if that's just in, in my brain, lit, quite literally, but I do feel that, um, I, you know, it's like working a muscle, I guess, because I've yeah. been, you know, actively working it every single day, it just to me feels sharper. So I, I totally appreciate you saying that. <laughs> yeah. Foreign language, learning a foreign language. That's like right at the top of the list is some of the best, yeah. some of the best things you can do for your brain. Yeah. I've really enjoyed it. It's a struggle, but yeah. I really enjoyed it. So um, speaking of the, you know, the every decade, the, the 5% uh, loss in size is that obviously can be preventable, but can it be reversible? Say that, you know, you were in your twenties and thirties and you were, you live in your best life possible. That included a lot of processed food, a lot of alcohol and very minimal sleep. Right. And you may have done some damage. Uh, can you switch that around and kind of reverse that? Yeah. So that it's interesting because it's hard to say for an individual, um, but for the general population, we actually do see that when people take these steps, um, these lifestyle changes, that their brain does look younger, like they can reverse some damage. And so just like an example where we see a lot of strong data on this is sleep apnea is mm -hmm. one of our big risk factors for memory loss. Yeah. And individuals who have sleep apnea and they don't treat it, they on average lose their memory 10 years before people who don't have sleep apnea. Wow. But if you treat the sleep apnea, all that goes away pretty much. Yeah. And the damage done to the brain due to sleep apnea, if you treat it, is reversible. And mm -hmm. it really highlights this idea that we, we really do strongly see that the brain wants to heal. It wants to, it wants to, to recover. And, uh, you know, it's, we have to be very careful to say that doesn't happen in all cases. And it depends upon the amount of damage done. But we do see these hopeful insights that the brain does, in many cases, try to recover and heal. And, and there's many ways to do that, which is, hope, which is hopeful. Yeah, that's really cool. So I, um, I, my followers hear me say this all the time. I'm like the perfect sleep subject. I feel, oh, yeah. I feel I am. I've, I've always been a really, really good sleeper. Um, and maybe you can clear this up for me. I always, I feel it's because I, I really use my brain. I feel like I do. I'm, I'm always, I'm very task oriented. I'm always using my brain. And my latency is literally like three to four minutes every single night when I go to bed, I fall asleep instantly. And normally they say that's a sign of, you know, you're overtired. I don't yeah. think I'm overtired. I genuinely feel like my brain's just like, okay, you, you know, you worked me and it's, it's time to now sleep, you know, and, and repair yeah. and to, to categorize those memories and stuff. My question for you, um, if this is in your area of expertise is when you sleep, there's obviously, you know, I wear an aura ring. Um, I'm fascinated by it, but the REM, the light sleep and the deep, deep sleep, um, how important each one of those are. Yeah. brain function because you know these little rings are awfully popular now and people can yeah. see if they're short on deep sleep or they're not getting into that rem sleep as long as they should do they see a correlation with brain health and the kinds of sleep that you get yeah absolutely um so that's great that you're a really good sleeper you're in the my you're, you're in the you're the lucky minority, <laughs> but that's really that's great because it's so important and yeah what's what's good to know is that even if you're not naturally a good sleeper you can learn things that really do improve sleep and make a difference and i'm one of those people who's naturally not a good sleeper but i i think part of the reason i'm so interested in sleep is that the the things that we can do really do help based upon because they're just rooted in how the brain works um so those three phases of the sleep cycle are critically important, um, especially the the deep sleep and the REM sleep. And just to put in perspective, when when you're in deep sleep, 
you're fighting off colds and viruses, you're, um, you're restoring your muscles, your, your bones, all you're basically like anti aging, you're like, mm. you're, you're, and if people don't get enough deep sleep, they actually age faster, internally and externally. So deep sleep is critically important. And then REM sleep is really important for memory. And so anything that you're learning during the day, which we said is one of the best things that you can do, you make a connection between your brain cells the moment you learn it, you make a new connection. But then when you go to sleep at night while you're in REM sleep, you find every new connection you made that day and you make it stronger, you make it stick. And so if you don't get enough REM sleep, you just won't remember the things you learned that day nearly as well. And so that's why those two phases of, of sleep are so important. And then one other thing that is just really amazing is that while you're, when you're sleeping at night, right after deep sleep, right before REM sleep, your brain actually shrinks down <laughs> to about 65% of its current size. And I know that sounds like a horror movie, your brain shrinking and squeezing in your skull, <laughs> but it's actually, it's actually squeezing out trash, toxins and waste and garbage that's that builds crazy. up. And it squeezes out into this like empty space because your brain is basically like a sponge squeezing out all the garbage and then fluid comes up from your spinal cord and you wash this trash away. So one of the most important things about sleep is that you're removing waste garbage and trash from your brain. And if you don't get a good night's sleep, mm. there's this accumulation of this garbage and that can really age the brain and damage it over time. And that's why we want to prioritize sleep and optimize it. And if you don't get a good night's sleep and you kind of have that foggy feeling the next day, part of what's happening there is that there's too much trash left in the brain. We didn't remove it. So I think that's one of the most powerful insights into, wait, well, I, I really need to focus on my sleep because I don't want this trash and this buildup because it's, it's damaging to the brain short term and long term. Yeah. And I, you know, I mean, working with people that, you know, one of their, their biggest goals is weight loss yeah. and the, just the importance alone of you know, sleep for weight loss. And then, yeah. you know, you start to think about something as important as an incredibly vital organ as the brain, how important that sleep is to, um, uh, prioritize that. So do you, do you recommend, you know, the typical seven to eight hours <laughs> uh, for adults? Um, yeah. Seven it's between seven and nine. Yeah. Um, some people can do fine on less than seven, but they're just really a small, per, like less than 1%. Yeah. Uh, people are getting less than seven usually are sleep deprived and then more than nine, unless you're like, you know, an athlete, you know, a high endurance athlete or, prof or you know, really intense athlete more than nine, we say that could be, we want to just check in and make sure everything's okay. There's not a reason why somebody needs more than nine. Um, but that seems to be um, the sweet spot for adults, somewhere between seven and nine. So there's that range. Oh, good deal. Yeah. Uh, so as, as the body or the, as the brain ages uh, through time, um, what happens to like other parts of the body, you know, in that process? So when the, the brain is aging, you know, do we see or feel this in other parts of the body specifically to uh, the brains um, getting old? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's it's a two way street. So, um, for example, like if our heart isn't healthy, then it's going to impact the brain because even little dips in oxygen because the heart's not delivering oxygen to the brain effectively can impact someone's memory that day and even years down the road, their blood pressure. But also the reverse is that something that we see very clearly is when the brain atrophies, you know, we would tend to think, oh, someone has trouble remembering. And yeah, that's definitely true. But we also see that they have trouble with things like balance and coordination mm -hmm. and how they, their posture, how they walk, the speed of their walking, the speed of their movements. And so your brain is controlling all that physical movement that you're doing. And one of the ways that we actually tell how old people are is we actually unconsciously assess their posture and their balance. And that's how we sense how old somebody is. And yeah. when the brain ages, those things deteriorate. But again, in all this, you know, kind of intense information, we clearly see that if we, it's use it or lose it. If we practice mm -hmm. balance, mm -hmm. we, we work on our posture, we, we exercise, all the things you talk about, <laughs> yeah. um, we, we really can keep our, our body much younger because we're keeping our brain younger. That's mind blowing to me. What a connection to to think of when you draw that picture in your mind of an elderly person or someone yeah. that you just instantly think, you know, they're, they've been, they've been hard on their body. Uh, yeah. you know, they suffer from sarcopenia. They've lost a lot of muscle mass. They've, their bones are deteriorating because of the way that they move or the way that they walk. But again, like I said, we just don't talk about this enough. You never yeah. think that it, that their brain plays a huge role in the way that they hold themselves, yeah. the way that they're able to, how quickly or slowly the move, they move, how that, you know, their walk, their balance, it's just, 
it's so stinking true. And I just yeah. don't think that we put enough love into the brain like we should just assuming that it's, it's always about, you yeah. know, and I, and I don't mean to, you know, to simplify it so much and say that we're so superficial, but you know, especially when we're in our, you know, twenties, thirties, forties, and even into our fifties, we think about, uh, you know, there's the three components of physical fitness. You've got the strength component, the cardio and the flexibility. We are really good about the strength and the cardio portion because the cardio helps you lose body fat and the strength helps you shape your body and give you that beautiful muscle. But we don't work on the flexibility so much because right. you don't see that. And it's right. kind of the same thing with sharpening the brain. It's not something that you necessarily see, yeah. um, but it's so stinking important. Yeah, yeah. No, it's so, it's so true. And also something that I talk about in the book a lot is that in our 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, that's when all the things are taking root that are going to mm -hmm. impact how our brain works 10, 20, 30, 40 years later. So it, on one hand, people say, oh, that's a little scary. But on the other hand, these things don't happen overnight you know, memory loss. So we can actually do things now to really lower the risk of memory issues or brain health issues down the road. So it's like kind of, you know, like investing now mm -hmm. <laughs> and same thing with our body and our brain. It's like we put in the, a little bit, it doesn't have to be a little bit each day really pays off, can pay off later. Yeah. So obviously with the, the way that the world has shifted and um, we've really taken note of you know our immune system and i know that a lot of people yeah. are, are are working really hard to build up their immune systems and to keep them nice and healthy now to keep them healthy down the road yeah. for whatever um, comes our way can you share a little bit with um, how brain health plays a really important role in our immune system yeah absolutely so really it's about it's not just about how we're feeling years from now mm -hmm. it's it's also how we're feeling today and to put this in perspective we talked about that waste and garbage that builds up in the brain and when you sleep you wash it out well there's another way that you get rid of that waste and that trash and those toxins just basically your brain makes byproducts and you have to get rid of it as we get older that process becomes less effective we're mm -hmm. not we can be not as good at it if we don't optimize or prioritize sleep and this one other thing and the other thing is, is that right now, as we're talking, you have this, basically this cell, it's part of your immune system, and it's swimming around your brain right now, gobbling up and eating trash, toxins and waste for you. And it's kind of like if you've ever seen an aquarium, that bottom feeder, you know, gobbling up yeah. the garbage and keeping the, the tanks the clean. Sucker fish. The sucker fish. You have something <laughs> like, you have something just like that in your brain. But the problem is, is that that, that like sucker fish, or we call it a microglia in the brain, th this microglia gets confused. And instead of mm -hmm. eating up the garbage, it makes this mistake and it, it's confused and it eats healthy brain cells. And mm -hmm. when it starts attacking healthy brain cells, that's when we see memory problems, increased risk for depression, anxiety. And because it's part of our immune system, what we realize is that if our immune system isn't functioning properly, those microglia cells, which are, which are immune cells, make this mistake. And some of the information that confuses them comes from our gut or our joints. It's inflammation. Inflammation mm. from the neck down is like a fire that sends like signals through the bloodstream that get make their way to the brain. And when they get into the brain, this inflammation that's spreading in the body, the microglia don't know what to do. They get confused. And instead of eating up the garbage, they eat up healthy brain cells. So that's a really, you know, intriguing, powerful realization that, wait a second, what's happening in my joints and my gut and my heart, if it's inflamed, that could be spreading to my brain and impacting my mood or my memory or just how I'm thinking and feeling each day. So there's this very strong connection between our immune system and our brain health. Yeah. So, you know, we're, we're starting to dip our toe into what really fascinates me is both the, the brain and the gut connection. And also, and I don't know if you agree with this term or not, but how they've kind of coined Alzheimer's as a uh, type three diabetes. Yeah. Uh, if you can, kind of uh, like really share, cause this fascinates me, um, yeah. the, you know, the connection between the gut and the brain and how we've just really here lately have just been like, wow, this is, you know, they really do talk to one another. And on yeah. top of that diet, you know, how much diet plays a role in the inflammation and the yeah. health of the brain. Yeah, absolutely. So if we try to tie this together, if we think about inflammation that's spreading from the gut to the brain, 
sending these signals that confuse those microglia into attacking healthy brain cells. Because we, we believe that a big part of what's happening in Alzheimer's, depression, any brain dysfunction is inflammation. It, it, it plays a part. It's not the only thing that's happening, but it plays a part. So we say, well, where does this inflammation come from? Well, a lot of it comes from our gut. And the food that we eat can either, if you think of inflammation like a fire, that's the way I like to think about it, some foods put the fire out and some foods fan the flames. Yeah. And so, you know, it, diet is complex and I know you talk a lot about it and, and definitely, as you know, like some things work for some people, some, some, things, some things work for other people. But mm -hmm. when we see with brain health, we, there's basically two things we see that are really important and powerful um, that are simple. And one is that just whole natural foods most of the time, like, you know, foods that are going to spoil <laughs> eventually, not when you eat them, but at some point they're going to spoil, you know, like the vegetables and the, um, the nuts, the beans, and just whole natural things, th those things, mm -hmm. olive oil, uh, Mediterranean-like diet sorts of things. Those things are anti-inflammatory and they lessen the amount of inflammation that spreads from the gut to the brain. And then the things that fan the flames of inflammation in the gut are really the, the added sugars, the, the processed foods, the hydrogenated oils, um, the ingredients when you look on the, the package, you're like, I can't pronounce this stuff. This is like a chemistry <laughs> experiment gone wrong. I don't know what this is. Those yeah. are things we just want to really, really try to minimize because they can cause, basically, if we take it one step further, what's really happening is that there's bacteria in your gut and bacteria like to eat there's good bacteria and there's bad bacteria and the good bacteria like to eat the whole natural foods and the bacteria actually help release anti-inflammatory um, factors that are good for your brain and your body. The processed foods, the hydrogenated oils, the high fructose corn syrups, the processed ultra processed ingredients, they feed bad bacteria and those bad bacteria release things into the bloodstream that completely confuse the microglia and they start attacking the brain and other parts of the body too. So, it really comes down to this relationship between what's in your gut and how it impacts your brain. Um, and so there's these, like, you know, as I mentioned, really just powerful connections there that it's not just, oh, you know, there's this gut brain connection. We actually are understanding how this all works. Have you tried countless diets, but you're still seeking your nutrition sweet spot? Are you trying to get results on your health journey to feel your best without being too restrictive? Now, I know how you feel. I've done the diet thing, but there never was that one that totally worked for me. And this is exactly why I developed the made diet. Now, I found that rather than restrictions, it's best to have a set of guidelines that allow you to customize based on your preferences and bio individuality while staying on track with your health and fitness goals. I found the nutrition sweet spot. And as a health and nutrition expert, I get asked all the time, what? when and how I eat. <laughs> and as someone who's passionate about education and helping others, I want to share that with you. Now, the Made Diet ebook lays it all out for you, taking the guesswork out of dieting. The Made Diet is a lifestyle plan that incorporates moderate protein, adequate fat, decreased carbs, and an introduction to intermittent fasting. The ebook gets right down to business by answering your most frequently asked questions. It includes thoughtfully designed recipes and a seven day sample meal plan to start you off right. It will honestly kickstart your weight loss journey and have you losing inches in your very first week. Now, intermittent fasting combined with these nutritional guidelines is honestly the piece that so many people have been missing when trying to get results. This ebook has all the information you need in a format that is condensed and to the point so that you can get to your results. If you're ready to get started, the Made Diet ebook is available immediately on my website for just $9.99. So head over to melissamadeonline.com forward slash made diet to take action towards feeling your best today. And once you do, oh my gosh, please let me know it's working for you. I am so honored to be a part of your health journey. Okay, back to the show. Mm, so I, in my schooling, learned a lot about being sympathetic and parasympathetic and obviously the vagus nerve. And I would yeah. love your intake on this uh, because again, there's just, there's always a yin to the yang of things. And I've always learned that you can't stimulate the vagus nerve, you know, uh, that you can't rub it and it can yeah. help, you know, the, the brain and the gut connection or to really just make an effort to put yourself in that parasympathetic state uh, 
because it's just overall good for the body. Yeah. Uh, what is your 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 thoughts and feelings on uh, the vagus nerve? And if you can, you know, if you can manually stimulate <laughs> it to help, you know, the, the yeah. brain and the gut talk to one another? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, interestingly, they've actually, the, the part of how we discovered, um, uh, you know, how the gut brain connection works was through the vagus nerve. Um, mm -hmm. And so what happens is that if we go back to what we were just talking about, those, those bad bacteria, if you think of the vagus nerve, I like to think of it like a guitar string uh, mm -hmm. that connects like the gut and the brain. And the bad bacteria, they release factors that stimulate the, that, that nerve or like a guitar string and they like pluck it basically very fast. And that sends signals to the brain that can make someone feel like anxious. Mm. Whereas good bacteria release factors that like calm the vagus nerve down and make somebody feel more calm. And so that's how we realize that, you know, people used to say, oh, you know, if I, if I'm nervous or I'm anxious, my stomach is off because I'm yeah. nervous and that's making my stomach feel off. But really what also can happen is that something's happening in your gut that's sending signals to your brain that's making you feel anxious. So it's like a, it's very much a two way street. And so, yeah, the vagus nerve is a really interesting uh, area of understanding of, you know, massage and all these things that can be done to that, that tie into this brain body connection. And it's a tangible, um, you know, something that people can do that is, uh, that's actionable and simple and just, you know, exercise is also something that helps the vagus nerve tone as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, yeah. And exercise and like box breathing and all this stuff yeah. that, that mindfulness, that just, all those things are great. Yeah, yeah. So, so, and so important these days, I do feel like yeah. we are chronically stressed and always in that state of, of, you know, not necessarily fight or flight so much, but in that, in those moments of always yeah. feeling kind of like you're on edge and how yeah. important it is to not only to get good quality sleep, but while you're awake to give yourself right. the 10, 10 minutes to, to find peace right? <laughs> somehow, <That's>, some way. <laughs> yeah. Um, so with my clients, a lot of times we have um, a lot of conversations about depression and anxiety. Mm -hmm. And I know that because we were earlier, you were talking a little bit more about, you know, the Mediterranean diet and, and healthy fats. And, and I have read and studied about how good, you know, these healthy fats are for the brain and that they can actually help with uh, depression and anxiety because those are connected to inflammation. Yeah. Is that something that you agree with? And um, can you elaborate on that if you do? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so those are a key, definitely a key part of a, a brain healthy diet. And those omega threes, the way I like to think about it in terms of like, you know, kind of a little bit of brain science <laughs> is yeah. that your, your brain cells are kind of like a wire, they, they send electricity through them. And that's how you move and how you think and how you remember they, they communicate your you have 80 billion brain cells in your brain. Wow. And they're sending all this electricity enough electricity to, to power a light bulb, believe it or not. <laughs> and so your brain cells are wrapped in a coating that is kind of like if you think about the coating on the wire from your, you know, your laptop to the wall, you notice it's not just a wire, it has that plastic coating. And that plastic mm -hmm. coating allows the electricity to make its way from the wall to the computer, otherwise it wouldn't make it there. It has to be coated. And the healthy fats coat your brain cells. Mm -hmm. And if you okay. don't have, you can't make that on your own. Some things we can make and some things we have to take in with our food. And so the omega threes, the healthy fats, that's the coating for our brain cells that allows us to send the electrical stimulation properly and effectively. And if we don't have that coating and we replace it with the unhealthy fats, because if our brain's not getting the healthy fats, we go, well, we just need to get something here. And they yeah. use the, the hydrogenated oils or the, the unhealthy fats and that coating just isn't as good. And that's why that can impact somebody's mood or, or how they how they, you know, how they feel, how they think, and, and over time, you know, significant impacts on their brain health. So we actually realized that, you know, eating like partially hydrogenated oil raises the risk of memory loss dementia by about 50%. And we believe part of what's happening is that, you know, in a complex puzzle is that we're replacing the good coding with not the optimal coding for our brain cells. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we, we want to prioritize those foods um, so that we're getting those, uh, so we can wrap our brain cells properly. Yeah. And I love that you say that because it's so similar to, you know, our hormones and our cells yeah. that, you know, you've got that, that fat lining. And if you, yeah. if you don't have the less than healthy fats, that lining is just not as permeable. It's not as flexible yeah. as those good natural fats that we need in our diet in order to have those healthy cells and healthy hormones. So I love that. Um, mm -hmm. Eat your fat people. Yeah. I uh, would love to know if, you know, if there's things that you can do, uh, you had mentioned, and I know that this is in the book, 
you know, exercises that you can do if yeah. dementia and non-genetic Alzheimer's uh, can be avoidable, you know, and some of the things, you know, specifically to, you know, exercises. And if you can share too, if there's anything, you know, like diet wise, besides, you know, the fats uh, yeah. and maybe avoiding the sugars uh, that you have found in your studies that really help keep those, you know, those illnesses at bay. Yeah, absolutely. So it's really all about lowering risk. That's what it's about is that we, we can't say it's just one thing. Um, it's, it's these, the accumulation of, it's kind of like you, you take the straws off the camel's back. It's, it's multiple things and we just want to take as many straws off the camel's back to lower risk. And two of the big straws are, are diet and exercise. They're just things that we can control and they have a big impact. So when it comes to exercise, um, one of the largest studies ever done on how to lower risk for dementia or Alzheimer's was that it found that if people walked for 30 minutes a day, they okay. lowered their risk of uh, memory loss by about 60%. Um, it, it's striking. I mean, a 60% reduction. And what was interesting was it didn't have to all be done at the same time. It could be like, you know, six, five minute walks, but walking is really important for memory and wow. brain health. When we, when we walk, we release a, a factor in our brain called BDNF. It's a, it's like a growth factor and it makes our brain cells more youthful. So, you know, it's easy in these modern times not to walk as much as we might've, you might, might, might've used to. So, you know, walking and incorporating in your day, something really simple um, that has a powerful impact. And then when you walk, if you think about about six to 10 minutes of the walking being a little bit more intense, like brisk, mm -hmm. uh, all these studies are coming in that there's something about brisk walking, it doesn't have to be the whole time, but somewhere about six to 10 minutes of it, you know, get the heart rate up is very important for memory that day and, and years down the road. And beyond that can be great. I mean, you know, exercise is, it, it, it can be some people, you know, very intense, some people moderately intense, and people find what's right for them. And there's many different types of exercises you mentioned that, you know, strength and flexibility and, and cardio, all those are good. But just for the general population that yeah. the amount where there's a threshold where people start to feel better and, uh, and see benefits short term and long term is not nearly as much as we thought which is really good. And so it's a great place to feel like, oh, I can do this. It's tangible. I can, I, I can make that goal. And then once people reach that goal, you know, very likely they're going to be like, I want to do a little more, a little more, which is also yeah. great too. That's I, you just made my day. And I, ever since July, I made a personal promise to myself to do three things. Um, and I can't remember the third, <laughs> there <laughs> goes okay. my memory, but I, I have red light, you know, just to stand in front. I bought red light uh, panels to stand in front of the red light. And uh, the other one was to, uh, oh, it's to drink um, my green tea every day because I know green tea oh, is good for you. And the third one. one, yeah, is to yeah. Uh, walk at yeah. least 30 minutes a day. Um, and Dr. Milstein, I don't think of the, since July, I have missed like more than 10 days. I mean, I'm, I'm, I love it. And I'll tell you, I think I'm going to be teacher's pet right now because <laughs> I, I practice my Spanish when I walk. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, that's I'm really working my brain. Um, yeah. And I, I purposely try to find places, like you said, to where there's a little bit of a hill. So I know during yeah. that walk at some point in time, you know, I will get that heart rate up. It's not just a completely casual walk, but there's always that just that little tiny bit of challenge, yeah. you know, that I have during the day to help, you know, really benefit from that. And I, again, just like knowing that me trying to learn Spanish has made me feel just more alive. So has the walking. Um, yeah. And yeah. so I'm, I just love to hear that 60%, you said. Yeah, reduction that lowers in that. risk. Yeah. That's incredible. And it's one of yeah. the things that I always plead to my, my clients is to incorporate that walking, especially yeah. after, after your meals. And you, you touched on a subject that I'm going to ask you about. Uh, and I always ask um, my guests this. And, you know, whatever your beliefs are, are, are wonderful. But what are, because you mentioned the BDNF, which I know is, is really important for uh, brain health. And I've been an intermittent faster myself for well over 25 years, uh, yeah. accidental intermittent faster. So I only eat about eight hours a day instead of, you know, the, the typical 15 hours. And studies have shown that fasting has improved, you know, BDNF function in the brain. Um, have you heard that yourself? Or how do yeah. you feel about, you know, Eat, eating, not necessarily the foods that we eat, the, the, the healthy fat, more Mediterranean style diet, but also uh, the timing that we eat, if you notice any difference with the brain. Yeah, definitely. So it falls under the category of it can work really well for some people. And um, 
and there's things we can take from it that can be important really for everybody. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, diet is, there's many ways to do it with a couple key principles. And the key principles that seem to be across all diets are whole natural foods most of the time and limiting the processed ingredients. And then within that, there's, there's definitely some things that work better for one person or the other. And we see studies that it's beneficial for, you know, brain health in many different ways, which is good because people can have some choices there. Um, we do see a lot of evidence with the Mediterranean diet because it's easy to follow. Um, it's, it tastes good. Um, but again, there's different options and people can find things that work within other, you know, variations of, of heart healthy, brain healthy diets. When it comes to the intermittent fasting, definitely there's evidence that it can be uh, beneficial. The only caveats are that for some people, if they have a certain underlying conditions, they just want to be careful, talk to their Absolutely. doctor first or, you know, nutritionist, make sure it's right for them. Um, but the thing that really we see is really beneficial from intermittent fasting that's applicable to just kind of everyone is really not eating throughout the night, like not waking mm -hmm. up in the middle of the night and eating unless you're, you know, like a pro athlete and you're on a very specific um eating plan, like having some space between your meals, allowing your brain to metabolize the food and your, your body to metabolize it, that space in between and giving your, 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 that time off, especially when it's nighttime. Um, we see that that really is helpful um, in terms of our metabolism just isn't as efficient at night. Um, it's just mm -hmm. evolutionarily programmed that way. And especially in the middle of the night. So that's something that we can take from from intermittent fasting as kind of a general principle, and then intermittent fasting is absolutely something that has um, merit and works for some people, and other people are like it's not quite right for me, and they find things that work, um, you know, for them. But it, it can be a very good choice for some people. Yeah, yeah. very well said. Yeah, uh, just popped in my mind because we're talking about diet. Can you give me your thoughts on and because the words and it's probably right behind me somewhere is a. Uh, I, uh, I think it's green brain. <laughs> oh yeah. You're, you know, how do you, yeah. How do you feel? Uh, do, do you agree with the, the notion that gluten has, you know, place, uh, places a lot of toll, um, on the brain? Um, I think that what we see is that if someone is sensitive to gluten, they definitely want to avoid it because it can cause inflammatory issues. It's, you know, it's a, an immune, it can upregulate or make the immune system overreact. Um, in terms of everybody stopping gluten, we just don't see the strong evidence for that. Instead, we say, you know, if you if you're sensitive to it, you definitely want to stop yeah. eating it and avoid it because it, it has it can do serious damage. But in terms of like fiber, fiber, um, certain types of fiber are really good for the brain and the gut um, as long as someone's not sensitive to it. But, you know, every food has their people who are sensitive and not sensitive to it. Right. So there's not really a yeah, there's not really a food where we would say it's especially a whole natural food where we'd say like everyone needs to avoid it, but yeah. instead find, you know, working with a nutritionist or a, a coach or a doctor and finding, you know, what is the right balance for a person, but saying that everyone needs to avoid um, grain is at this point, we believe an overstep because we want to just say that fiber is one of the best things for your gut bacteria if you can, if you can tolerate it. And one way to get yes. that is through, you know, um, uh, you know, grain. And, and as long as yeah. there's good grains too, there's very good yeah. grains out there too, that are better than processed. So we just want to be, you know, make that, make that uh, awareness. And I love that. Um, I think that's just a very smart thing to think of. And, and I just want to, on top of that, say caveat, you do, you know, you never, sometimes you don't know that you're sensitive to something until you maybe try to go without that to yeah. see if there's any kind of change whatsoever. Cause maybe yeah a fog will lift, or maybe you're like, you know, 30 days later or, you know, six weeks later, whatever your choice is, you're like, I don't, I don't really feel any different, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you as an individual will never know until you kind of take that into your own hands. And instead of listening to me or listening to Dr. Bilstein or, you know, a book or a, you know, social influencer that you find those kind of things out for yourself because, yeah. you know, you may or may not be. And generally speaking, it's, it's, a, I think it's a lot less people than what, people assume, you know, that there is some sensitivity to it, but it's not on this huge grand scale, but you right. could be one of those people that could be sensitive yeah. to it. And so put it into your own hands and maybe try to do without it to see if you notice any kind of a difference. Yeah. Yeah. And also just thinking about the processed, the processed grains versus the mm -hmm. more natural grains. And that, that's a great thing to experiment with because sometimes people will report, oh, I feel a lot better now that I've eliminated some of the more, you know, refined 
process wins. Yeah. All right. So uh, I'm sure everybody would love to know, as I would as well, uh, what are some of the things, you know, your habits, your practices that you do <laughs> on a daily basis to help keep your brain healthy? I'm, I'm assuming you probably eat a pretty healthy diet and you, you get those walks in and stuff, yeah. but is there anything else that you do particularly uh, knowing as much as you do that help keep your brain healthy? Um, yeah. So the, I, I think part of the reason I'm so fascinated by these things is that I need them. <laughs> I need these tips more than anybody. <laughs> so I, I, uh, I, I'm one of those people that I, I have to do these things or I, I'm not at my best. So um, one of the things that is really rooted in brain science that I that I have adopted is I prepare for my night's sleep right after I get up in the morning. <laughs> and what I mean by that is that you have this clock. It's actually just this won the Nobel Prize recently. Is that this is discovery that there's this like kind of clock or a timer in your brain and it counts down to when you're gonna fall asleep at night. And mm. the way that you start the countdown is by within about a half hour of waking up, getting outside into natural yeah. light for about 10 minutes. Okay. And that is something that if I don't do that, I, I struggle with sleep. But if I do that, I mean, not only do I feel better, but there's that natural light, it's it's your, your brain clock or your super charismatic nucleus, if anyone wants to look more into it, that's really fascinating. And it's an example of something so simple yeah. that is so powerful and it impacts mood, metabolism, sleep. It's a master regulator of the brain and the body. So mm -hmm. I would say that that quick walk in the morning of getting natural light is something that is um, one example of things that very small thing that can have a big impact. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. And and for, you know, for maybe people that get up, you know, or, or in areas where, the, you know, the light and the dark is, yeah. is a little bit uh, subjective to uh, get, I hate to use the word artificial light, but like a light yeah. box or something that yeah, still gets helpful. that, yeah, those, those, that bright yeah. light. And I just read uh, here recently, uh, Dr. Bilstein, that uh, your your gut is kind of the same way that when you have that first sip or bite of food, you have that clock in your system yeah. that your um, digestive system is like, okay, I'm good, you know, for about another 12 hours, I'm good right. to to digest well. And then like you said, in the evening, the digestion starts, you know, to not work near as well. So being very aware of when you wake up and you tell your body, hey, I'm awake, and then when you eat and you're telling your body, okay, food's coming in for, you know, a, a certain amount of time and not super late at night because it does disrupt quality sleep uh, is uh, really important. It seems to be really emerging science on, yeah. on the importance of, you know, the circadian rhythm and all that stuff. So that's yeah. fascinating. I love hearing that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a really, we're, our body and brain is on the clock <laughs> and if we can tap into it, um, it can really be helpful. Yeah. So I have uh, one more question for you uh, is, Memory is, you know, and I have to, as, as sharp as I feel I am, um, I, my husband and I, we remember totally, I want to say we remembered, we've been together 33 years, but I want to say that we remember different things, not meaning that we're at the same place and we remember it differently. He has memories that, that I don't remember. I'm sure they happened, but like yeah. when we first moved into our house, what color the walls were, we all have a memory of when we went on vacation, uh, how good the salad was. I mean, we just, it, and I, we never seem to remember the same things. Uh, is there any kind of explanation to that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's very, that's very, um, it's, 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 it's really great. You notice that because it's very true. That's the way that uh, memory works. It's very, memory is highly subjective okay. um, and not very accurate. <laughs> so um, <laughs> that's why eyewitness testimony is really not people are surprised to hear that it's not weighted that strongly because what happens is is that not only are we all biased in some ways in terms of you know i am a i might be more of a visual memory person i remember mm -hmm. how things look someone else like well, i remember how things smelled or i remember how things i yeah. how i hear how i heard them and we all based upon our you know our, our our brain and our environment and how we grew up and all these different factors we tend to be more visual or auditory or tactile and we, our memories are stronger based upon those things. If, if you know what you are, it's actually gonna be very helpful when you wanna learn things. Cause like, oh, I'm more of a visual person. I'm, I like to, yeah. you know, I like to read the book or I like to listen to it on tape or I like to talk mm -hmm. about it. Things like that um, are really good to know cause it, you can help you tap into the strengths of, of, your, of everybody's individual brain and everybody has individual strengths. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing, just a quick thing about that is that every time that you, um, when you experience something like let's say you were talking about your um, 
you moved into the house and, and what you remember. When you were in the house that first day, you made connections in your brain for the memories. And then every time you revisit the connection, you actually break it apart and you put it back together. Okay. But you might not, and most likely, you don't put it back together the same way your husband does. So his memory, mm. you attach it to different things. So over time, your memories drift. And it's very okay. normal between someone else. You say, remember that party? And you're like, I don't remember that at all. Like, it's a totally different memory. Yeah. And people say, well, why, why do we have that? Very likely, the reason our brain works that way is that accuracy of memory is not nearly as important as adaptability. So we mm. evolve, we change, we grow, we recover, you know, we get over, we, we, we hopefully get over things and we, because our brain is constantly trying to adjust to situations. And so that's why, you know, not to get on a totally different subject, but that's why therapy works is that, that mm -hmm. you revisit memories and you put them back together in a way that gives you new perspectives and it doesn't happen overnight, but it takes time. But a wonderful thing about, about our brain is that it's not stuck. <laughs> it's changeable. Yeah. And the, 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 the side effect of that is that our memories aren't that accurate, but we just sort of have to be like, okay, <laughs> yeah. that's the way it goes because I'm able to learn, adapt, change, and see things from new angles and perspectives and yeah. grow. Uh, gosh, two, two things on that. The first one is I used to te teach group exercise for a really long time. Yeah. And I learned over the years that because I would teach routines um, that I would have people in the back of the class do really well. And I would have people in the front of the class do really well. And it dawned on me that some of them were um, audible. And so they didn't have to see me. They could, it was a crowded class and they could yeah. be in the back, but as long as they could hear me, they could follow yeah. along. And then there's people that would always tell me I couldn't be in the back of the class because I have to see you, I have to watch you. And those are the visual people yeah. when it comes to learning. And you've got this kinesthetic that are all over the room. But once I learned that, that was, that was huge in me helping other people learn yeah. how to remember things because of the way, and, and they, they didn't realize that they, you know, they probably thought they're in the back of the class because they're shy or it wasn't important for them to be seen, but that's right. where they learned the best. And, and where these, you know, these visual people needed to be right up front with the mirror there so they could watch themselves and watch me and, and look and see in order to learn, which I think is fascinating. Yeah. Um, gosh, I had one more point um, about what you were saying, which was just fascinating to me, but um, can we, can we improve? proof our memory you know even you know me at 49 yeah. years old are there you know besides the sleep and the diet yeah. uh are there ways that you can specifically help improve the memory yeah absolutely so um beyond i think of we think of the brain as like the health of it is important and so a part of the book is just about you know how do i how do i optimize my sleep my diet my exercise all these what we think are disconnected conditions, but they really are connected. Right. And then a whole nother part of the book is about, okay, how do I just improve my memory? How do I remember where I put my keys and park my car and, and that person's name and-, and wait, The and cell then, phone in your hand, yeah, you can't yeah. find. <laughs> right, right, or that, that, what was that, what's that name of that person? And there's all these insights we now have based upon how our brain works mm -hmm. um, that really can improve your day-to-day -day memory. And so memory is also very much use it or lose it. And we mm -hmm. live in a world now where we're not using our memory like we used to, you sure. know, you know, we, we have you tried to remember a phone number <laughs> lately? It's exactly. like, exactly. Like That's impossible. what I was just thinking. Yeah. yeah. And so if we can, there's some tricks and tips on how to practice those things um, okay. so that we can remember because otherwise it, it we get really rusty and, and over mm -hmm. time it can be hard to remember things. So um, it, the good news is absolutely, you know, there are memory champions out there. Uh, who, who like are memorizing decks of cards in five seconds. Yeah. They're great, but we, we all can improve too, which is really good. Yeah. <laughs> which is just like reading. I mean, when you, if you haven't read for a while and you pick up a book, you feel like it takes forever, but the, yeah. the more you read, the faster you get at it. And yeah. I remembered what I was going to say. I don't want to keep my following hanging because in your introduction, I talked about toxins. Um, yeah. Can you really fast, uh, you guys need to get this book, but can you just, you know, give us kind of a, a quick blip of the toxins that, that you talk about that really affect the brain? Yeah, this is an area that's really um, becoming more and more understood and how powerful it is that really the the health of our planet is impacting the health of our brain. Um, so air pollution, for one, we're, we're just seeing all these studies now that polluted air raises the risk of memory loss, depression, anxiety. And so it, it first, say, wait, is that really connected? But your your brain is actually right at the top of your nose. And so anything that's coming in when you're breathing is impacting your brain health. Um, so we just want to, you know, prioritize 
clean air. And the other thing is, is that, you know, of course, we all live in different areas and sometimes air is cleaner than others. They did these studies where they found that if you just spend you know, some time, like a half hour, 40 minutes a day in a park, you know, mm. somewhere that is getting some nature, um, that can be really helpful to counterbalance if you're living in a, you know, in a congested area or, or uh, on a busy street, things like that. So there's all these things that we can do as we as we just want to make these things, you know, be aware that these things are important. Um, the products in our home can be impacting too the health of our brain too. So just being careful, you know, not to have, you know, the, the too many chemicals and, you know, we don't have to go, we don't want to add too many things to our to-do list. I mean, nobody wants right, to make major right. changes. So the, it's really about what are the simplest things we can do that have the biggest impact and just looking at a couple things here and there. Okay, what can I do? Oh, uh, you know, if I'm in an area where there's a lot of uh, air quality issues, I want to make sure I get some time in a park or I want to make yeah. sure I get some time in some nature. If I'm thinking about what am I going to get, you know, in terms of a cleaning product, you know, I'm going to go with something that's maybe a little bit more natural just because I just want to make those just a couple decisions can go a long way instead of being like, you know, we don't want to overwhelm. That's it's it's too much. And we don't want people to yeah. feel anxious or worried. It's 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 not again, it's not one thing, it's the accumulation of factors. And if we can do these things to bring the straws off the camel's back, we can push the odds in our favor. Yeah, it's it's the analysis paralysis. You just get yeah. there's too much and you just yeah. don't know what to do. And I assume that you could even as you look, because we only live in this house part time, so I can't, but the probably the importance of even just having plants in the house, you know, yeah. getting out in nature is great, but having windows that are, that let in bright light yeah. and having lots of plants to keep the air clean, you know, maybe yeah. an air filter, just simple things like that, that don't take any energy whatsoever, but right. on a day-to-day -day basis would have a, a huge profound effect. Well, I am. I'll, I'll give you one. I don't want to interrupt you, but I'll just give you one no, yeah. quick, last quick tip is that. Oh, I'd love it. Ten, 10 minutes in nature has found to lower stress levels significantly. Nothing wrong with stress, but if it's too much too often, we, you know, it's not good, but 10 minutes in like a local park, so they did a study in Japan and they found that if people just stared at a plant on their desk for two minutes, their stress <laughs> levels drop. So I just wanted yeah. to say what you said about plants in your home and those little things that it's all about like little, little, little things here and there. That's like, oh, over time, they, they can just be so helpful. Yeah. I mean, even what a, we could just probably talk about this forever. What a great gift, you know, give someone yeah. the gift of a plant. I mean, you're not right. only, you know, cheering them up, but you're helping lower their stress. You're helping right, lower right. their air quality. <laughs> Right, You're right. helping their brain health, which is just yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Um, uh, Dr. Mills, I'm, I'm leaving this conversation um, very excited because I feel like I am doing a lot of things to help with my brain health. It's not something that I have studied near as extensively as nutrition and gut health and, you know, macros and, you know, resistance training and all that stuff. And I feel very hopeful that I'm doing things that are helping keep my, because like I said, my grandfather, uh, uh, had dementia when he passed away. And I, so I know it runs in the family and I, you know, really want to take good care of my brain. Uh, want to be that hundred year old that's still running around uh, loving life. And so I feel like I'm doing some things and I've also learned things that I could be a little bit better at. And um, I wanted to thank you for your time for that. If you wouldn't mind sharing with our audience uh, where they can find you, if you're on social media, a sure. website and where they can find the book. Well, thank, thanks so much for having me. It was just so great talking to you. I really appreciate it. Um, if you want to find out more, um, just my website is drmarkmilstein.com, M-A-R-C, and then my last name. And then um, uh, I'm doing some more things on social media. So at um, drmarkmilstein.com on Instagram and things like that. And then the book is The Age Proof Brain, which is a really simple, fun, actionable, take home things that you can do. Um, there's, it, it's, it's, rooted in science, but it's not a boring science class. It's more like, these are the things that you can do, understand how your brain works and how to make it work better based upon some, you know, actual simple things. And it's, we talked about the, the gift of a plant. What a great book to give somebody, because this is beneficial to somebody, you know, uh, someone going off to college and it's for their memory and their brain health. And it's beneficial for your grandmother. I mean, what a great gift to give someone oh, I appreciate uh, a, a book like that. Um, I, I truly believe that. And um, very, uh, just very excited. And, and I thank you so much for giving us the time. I feel like uh, on this podcast, we've done a really good job of talking um, on all areas, but this was one area that's lacking that I, I now feel very confident yeah. that I've given my viewers um, something to really help them with, you know, one of two of the most, well, they're all really important, but my goodness, your brain is an important organ <laughs> that I don't think it gets the love that it deserves. So thank you so much, sir. Thank you.
You're welcome. So I hope you guys, uh, especially after listening to this, uh, wake up feeling prepared and go to bed feeling proud. Have a great day, you guys. Wow, we've reached the end. But before I leave you, I'd love to hear from you. After all, it's not every day that someone reaches out and asks for your opinion. And to me, your opinion does matter. So please share this episode with anyone that you think needs to hear this message. And remember to rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. My name is Melissa McAllister. And until next time, thank you for being your own health advocate.